and we have these two squares, one for care management and one for utilization management. Um, today, we're going to focus on the bar at the top and the square for utilization management. Um, we do have the care management square here because there are some users of the system that do um, population health, such as disease management, health coaching, things like that. So that's why you see that here, but we're going to focus on these other sections um, for what your usage in the system will be. Oops. So here on this top bar is called our provider portal menu bar. Um, this bar will be available to you no matter where you are in the system. So if you want to get back to the home page or start a new search, you always have that availability um, just at the top of the screen. So our Qualitrack logo over here on the top left will always bring you back to that home page. So that first page we looked at when we logged in our landing page, um, you'll notice the Qualitrack logo is up here. Anytime you click on that, it will take you back to this page um, so you can start over with whatever you're doing. The next icon is the magnifying glass. And this is what we use to start a search. So if you click on that, you'll have the option to do a member search or a case or a review search. Um, we're gonna get into this in a little bit more detail in a slide or two, because um, most of our work starts with that member search. But again, you can always use this icon um, to do a new search if you're done looking at something in the system. The third one here that has the three bars is called our task icon and it will take you to our task queue. Um, you guys won't see a lot of tasks, but when you do, it'll be stuff like a request for information. So if you submit a review through the system and our reviewers take a look at it and they're like, oh, it's missing this medication list or something like that, they'll send back a request for information and there will be a task listed in that task queue um, from someone for your organization to complete. The circle with the question mark is our knowledge center. And in that area, we post things such as user guides, um, if there's any system FAQs, if there's any new functionality in the system that we think um, may necessitate a tip sheet to help guide you through that process, we post all of those in the knowledge center. Um, these specific trainings or presentations won't be posted there. They'll be posted on those websites that we talked about. Um, but just basic user guides on how to use the system are located in that Knowledge Center. And then the last icon here, the circle with the kind of person in it, is called our My Profile icon. Um, this is where you can click on that if you need to make any updates to the information we have about you in the system. So if your email address changes to make sure you complete, continue to get those system notifications, you can update that in there. Um, maybe a phone number and address, all of that can be updated. And this can be done by anyone that has a user account in the system. You can go in and make those changes yourself. That doesn't have to go back to the authorized official or anything else for that changes to be made. And then I don't have it listed on the slide, but if you click on that drop down arrow, that's where the logout link is. So you can log out of the system once you're completed um, with your work. So like I said, we're gonna focus on this search um, pieces of the system to start off with, because everything that happens, if you're submitting a new review, you maybe wanna check on the status of review, all of that happens within that member's information. So you can usually start a member search to find all of the information that you need. So here on the utilization management square, you'll see we have a search with that magnifying glass. And then we talked about that magnifying glass up on the top right hand corner of the screen. You can select or click on either one of those and it will take you to our member search screen. So you do have two options um, for how you search for members. One of them is a member ID and date of birth, and then the other is a member first name, last name, and date of birth. Um, we do receive um, information from the state on the Medicaid members, and we do load that into the system so that you have the opportunity to search against that. Um, we know with PASAR, not every PASAR level one that needs submitted is on a Medicaid member. So we do also have the option to add a member, which we'll walk through as part of this training. Um, but first we'll kind of walk through how each of these searches work. So for the member ID and date of birth, um, you would enter 
the Medicaid ID for that member and their date of birth. And then you would click the search button. And the system does require an exact match on that ID and date of birth for it to return any results from that search. Um, so if you click the search button and you get a response that says member not found, um, please check that member ID and that date of birth that was entered. I know sometimes the day and the month can get switched around when things are written down and things like that. Um, so just check, make sure you've entered everything correctly and then try that search again. Um, and then if it matches, the system will return that um, information back to you to select from. Same thing with member um, name and date of birth. So you'll enter that first name, last name and their date of birth and click the search button. Again, we need that exact match to happen um, so that we have the correct information and know that we're giving you the correct information to take a look at. Um, it'll return if there's a match and if not, um, it'll give you that option to add a member. So if we're able to match, this is what it looks like when it returns that information. So it'll list their um, identification information or number, last name, first name, date of birth and gender if we have it. You can click on any of these blue data elements to actually take you to our member hub to start that process of submitting a review or checking on a review. If the system doesn't find a match, you'll see this, this message that says member not found. I mean, again, you can check all the information that you've entered, make sure it's correct and try that search again, or we can add a new member. Like we said, we know with PASSAR that not everyone is a Medicaid member and there will be times when you'll have to add a member into the system. So to do that, we just click that add member box and it will open our add member page. Um, one thing to note when you're actually working in Qualitrack, you'll see that some of these data elements have a red asterisk behind them. Anytime there's a red asterisk, that means that we, um, the system has to have the data filled in in that area so that it can complete the process that you're asking it to do. So we have to have a first name and a last name to add a member into the system. Um, we need to have, we have to have a birth date. Gender is also a selection. I do want to point out here on the identifiers, you'll see that we have a social security number and a member ID. Um, you may not have both of these. You may only have one. So if you have a social security number, you can enter it in here and then you can use the NA, the little box in front of that to say, I don't have a member ID. I'm not going to enter it or vice versa. Um, a member ID when you're creating a member does not always need to be a Medicaid ID like we talked about in the search. If you have an insurance card with their ID number on that, you can enter that in the member ID um, in place of a security, social security number, things like that. Once you have all the relevant information entered, you'll click the submit button and that will add that member into our system. And then they will be there for you to search um, next time you need to find them. Once you do that, or you've selected the member that has been returned from your search, it will take you to what we call our member hub. Um, Qualitrax is a very member-centric platform. So any of the information about that member that you as a user have access to see will be visible in this member hub area. So you'll be able to see their demographic information like their member ID, date of birth, things like that. Um, and then you'll also be able to see here in this utilization management panel, any reviews that have been submitted either by your organization or, or on behalf of your organization or any that you're kind of, that you're have visibility to, they'll all be listed there under that member. This is also the place that you'll start a new review for this member using this orange add button over here to the right side. Um, Jean's gonna cover everything from this point on in next week's training session. But like she said, we kind of want to just give you an introduction, let you know what the system looked like, um, how things kind of flowed through it, and some of the basic navigation things. So I will stop my presentation and I will let Jean take over with the Q&A. 
Perfect. I'm going to unmute before I speak. I'm learning my lesson. Um, I'm going to go through and read the chat. We get a lot of great questions, so please feel free to keep them coming. Um, this is our third time doing this content today, so we have some other information too that we might elaborate on when the Q and A is kind of spark our our interest there. So I'm going to scroll back up to the top um, and. Will these steps be sent out at the end of the webinar? I get all information. I can't say this enough. All of our information is going to be posted on the PassR training website that's on HickPup's main PassR page. There's a little tab there for PassR training. That's where the flyers for these training sessions are. That's where all of our video content will be. And that will be posted by the end of this week, I believe, for all of last week's content and today's content. All of that content includes the slide deck, PDF version of all the slides, our recording and MP4 file of the recording of these sessions. So there's three of those available. And then a transcript from the session and a Q&A summary document. Um, that Q&A summary document will take all three trainings and combine the questions that were asked at all three. So in one document, you'll be able to see kind of a summary of the Q&A. So again, one slide deck, one transcript, one Q&A document, and three videos. So that's all of the content that's gonna come out for each of these webinars we're doing. We did one last week, the one today, and then one next week. So we want you to have as much information as you can to help you digest and learn to match your learning style. So hopefully that, that will help and we will get all of that uploaded uh, well before the go live. That will include all the steps. So when should we be expecting the email with the link to complete the registration? So as Stephanie mentioned, that week of February 22nd, so we really encourage folks to get the provider executive identified, to get the authorized officials identified, and to complete that, that part of the registration now as soon as possible. Stephanie shared where all those links are. That's out there for you. Some people have already done it. We've already had a, several people that have completed this step already. So once you've identified your provider executive and your authorized official, then you start building your list of the users that are gonna be needed in the system because the authorized official will get an email with the link to set up all the accounts on February 22nd. You will not get that email sooner than that. And the reason that Stephanie mentioned is because it, it's a time sensitive email and our system is not available until March 1st. That's our go live date. So there would be nothing for you to go and set up. So we really need you to not get that email until the 22nd. Um, Stephanie, anything to add there in terms of the timing of when people will be able to get this stuff going? Nope, that sounds great. Thanks. Okay. Um, and then are you talking about a Medicaid provider number if we don't have an MPI? Um, so that's a great question too. So part of the way our system works in terms of a visibility is every user, when they're creating their profile, when the authorized officials creating them, they create them under this umbrella under this NPI or ID number umbrella. Um, so what we're doing for case management agencies that don't have a traditional MPI, and I believe Obi or Pam, if either of you are on, can speak to this as well. Um, we're gonna have a, a different number for you um, that you can use because it's really important that we have a unique identifier for your entire agency. And then each person under that umbrella can be connected with that so that when your agency is on a case and you've, the agency has been given visibility, every single user that's connected with that number can see that member's information. Um, that really helps when you guys have one person that started it, another person that needs to finish it, people go on vacation, people have lives, re the real world happens, and sometimes you need to hand something over to a colleague. So we really love the visibility of Qualitrack, but it all kind of rests on having a unique identifier for the agency. Um, and I'll stop there, just ask if Pam or Obi, do you guys wanna to speak to what that number is for case management agencies that do not have an MPI number? Gene, this is Stephanie. Um, oh, they sure. should know what we call a Medicaid I'm not, ID. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so Medicaid ID number. Yeah, okay. yeah. And if anybody has any problems or needs help, um, I don't know if you shared my email, but you can share it. They can reach out to me. But yeah, if they don't have an NBI, NPI, if they can enter their Medicaid ID, if they don't know what that is, let me know, um, and we can work through that with them. Okay. And you're S. Wilson, right? Because I just put your email in the chat. I am, yes. S. Wilson oh. Intelligent. 
Pam, I see you're there too. Pam, did you want to weigh in on the ID number for case management agencies also, or do we cover it? I was just going to say the same thing, the Medicaid ID. They okay. should have one, um, whatever their ID is with the department um, is, is an ID that can be used as well. Okay. That was a little quiet for me, so I'm going to try to repeat that. So yeah, it's your Medicaid ID number on file with the department. So whatever your agency uses as that identifier, that's what you'll put on your registration for Qualitrack. And that's what we'll connect you. Hopefully that helped answer that question. Um, let me scroll back up to the top here. Okay, can you add the link here in the chat? Yes, I will make sure that one of us, uh, I'm talking right now, but as soon as I stop talking, um, we'll add the link for both the PASSAR portal and for, or for the Qualitrack portal for the Qualitrack registration, which is under the heading Senior Long-Term Care. And those of you at case management agencies know that Telligen's doing more for Colorado than just the PASSAR. We have a couple other tasks we're working for them. So our Qualitrack system is being used for a variety of things, not just PASSAR. So the link to PASSAR, or the link to Qualitrack, sorry, and the link to all the Qualitrack documentation is is going to stay at that senior long-term care site and then anything past our specific like these trainings that you're on right now the training material um any other you know question answer faq documentation will live on the state's hickpuff uh, pass our website so there's two really important links to get out there i'll make sure those both of those get into the chat before the end of this session um next up Oh, what's the difference between the author I Oh, no, I think this was actually about the, the two halves of Qualitrack. So that landing page that Stephanie talked about had a U utilization management section, and then it had a care management section. So Qualitrack is a portal, an online portal, very much like an EHR in that it has different modules, it has different components, and clients can, you know, use different modules as, as they, they want to build their own. So care management is a whole section of Qualitrack that's used for our care management contracts that we have, our kind of disease management contracts that we have. We have several of those around the country. So that's really a section about care management. For our purposes of PASSAR, we're gonna be using the utilization management section of Qualitrack. And what we've done to that utilization management section is we kind of built an attic on top of a great house. Um, that attic is where PASSAR lives. So PASSAR is not a utilization management function. PASSAR is truly just a member assessment, um, but we're doing it through that section of Qualitrack because it makes sense. Um, it follows a great workflow in that you, the community, a provider has something you want us to review. You have a content you want us to review. You have clinical documentation you want us to review. It needs to come to us in a queue so that we can get them first come first serve. We can review them. If we need additional information, we can talk to you about it and then we can render an outcome. Um, so that really does fit well to live in that section. So that's why we built the pass our attic on top of the house of the utilization management. We won't be using care management for this work. Hopefully that helped explain the difference there. Um, and then another question we get that I thought that one was at first, which is can the authorized official and the provider executive be the same person? And yes, they can. Um, are the tasks in the task queue specific to the person logged in or are they agency wide? Good question, Mercedes. Um, I will try to answer this one as well. So when the submitter who, cause we're connecting each user account has an email address. So that's a one-to-one -one relationship between a user account and an email address. Whatever user ID is on the submission of that level one, that submitter, as we call them in our uh, Qualitrack speak, becomes the, the one who gets notified. So you would get an email if your account submitted the pass art, you get an email notification that there's an RFI task. However, anybody under your umbrella of that Medicaid ID number, of that MPI number, anybody under that umbrella, when they log in and they go to a task queue, they would see that task. So anybody can complete it. Anybody can take it out of the queue, but only the email address associated with the user ID of the submitter is going to get the email notification. 
a lot of new terminology we're throwing out here for you. Um, submitter and um, authorized official, these are a lot of new terms. So I'm hoping that the more times people can view this content or interact with it, those terms will start to, to have meaning and make sense. So only the submitter gets the email, the whole, anybody connected with the MPI can see the task and complete it. Um, is the member ID, the state Medicaid ID number? Yes. So in Qualitrack that we get a daily enrollment file from, from the state of Colorado about the Medicaid enrollment. So we can see anybody that had ever had Medicaid, um, we'll have them in that file. And then once they're in our database, they're in our system. Um, and that's for Medicaid. So obviously PASAR is not Medicaid specific. PASAR is whatever the, you know, funding source of the member is. Um, so we do have that add member feature for those folks, but the default member ID in the system when you're searching would be a Medicaid ID number. That's why we have two options for how to search for members. One option is using that identifier. And then a second option is using the first name and last name because you may not have a Medicaid ID number. And that's something else to note with this process is if you're the one to add a member to Qualitrack because you couldn't find them in the search, that member's there for everybody. You're, you're no longer the only one that can see that. That is someone who's in the system. They will be searchable in the future and people will be able to find them. Um, I'm wondering, Stephanie, if we could talk a little bit about merging um, of records, because there is always the chance that you would get a duplicate. We want to avoid that as much as possible. So if you think that this person's ever had Colorado Medicaid or has it now, please try to look for them so that we don't create a bunch of duplicate accounts. Um, we do have a way in the back end to manage that if it does happen, but we take data integrity and PHI very seriously. So we would not want to combine two accounts unless we were absolutely positive that the identifying information connected. Um, so Stephanie, anything more to say about merging accounts while we're on that? Well, pretty much you covered it. Yeah. As long as we have enough true matches on identifying information, we can merge those on the back end. If anybody ever sees two accounts that they think are the same, they can let us know that through the help desk and then we can follow up on that and see if they need to be merged or not. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as long as we can do that within systematically, that will be, that will happen as often as needed. Mm -hmm. So that Medicaid ID is not going to, so the next question too dovetails into this, which is, um, is the member ID number in your portal, the member's social security number or the state ID? Um, first likelihood is that it's the Medicaid ID number. Um, however, if this member had been created by somebody else uh, a week ago or a day ago, that ID number would end up being the social security number um, if that's how they created the member when they added them. Is that correct, Stephanie? Yes, that's my understanding. If you know a social security number and we have it, or you know the Medicaid ID and we have it, you can search for either of those. Mm -hmm. Again, it has to be an exact match and you don't put any dashes or spaces or things like that. You just enter the numbers, you know, one after the other until you have them all entered in that date of birth and then you can search against that. Mm -hmm. Our member ID is also a nine digit number. Um, it may have leading zeros, but it, they're, they're both nine digit numbers. So I think that that helps. Um, so will it be possible to see completed PASARs submitted by other organizations? Yes. If your organization has been added to the case, this is another language terminology. So in the Qualitrack system, we call a PASAR a case. We call anything that gets submitted is a review. And then anything submitted before that review joins it at the case level. So the case is our hierarchy term for one kind of episode of care and each episode of care would get its own pass our process, right? To start it off. So that's the case that we're talking about. So if you've been added to the case of Qualitrack uh, for that member and that pass our, you have visibility into it, even if you did not create it, even if you are not part of the submitting agency. Um, but we will need someone already with visibility to add you. Um, you can't add yourself because you wouldn't see it to be able to add it. So there does need to be some coordination there, but one of the great things about the system is if you've been added, you can see it. You did not have to complete it. You do not have to be the admitting facility. We have built in flexibility specifically to this point that there's this nuance where agencies that don't have a traditional MPI, uh, members that don't have a traditional Medicaid number and agencies that aren't a traditional submitter or provider 
um, are able to still have visibility. So hopefully that helps answers that question as well. Um, seems like you can have several members with the same social security number or date of birth because of shortened names, nicknames, or middle names. Exactly. Um, so Risa, that is a wonderful point, which is why we really care about avoiding duplicates to the extent possible. And we highly recommend that when you are searching for a member, you get creative, you try a couple different things. Um, if you know the name is Michael, try Mike, try Michael. Um, really try to see if you can find them in there. If, if you believe the person has Colorado Medicaid, they should be in that file. So try getting creative. Um, and again, if you notice a duplicate record that you believe is the same because of an alias um, or because of a nickname or um, a change of name, there's a lot of reasons we could end up with duplicates in this system because we have flexibility to create members. Um, it, it, there's both sides to that coin. So we want your help in how to help avoid duplicates for situations like that. So Risa, very good point. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, and we do have a way to merge accounts. So when that does happen, we can do it. We just need to partner with you on that. Um, Rachel has a question here. Will we be able to see clients who we don't have visibility on yet um, and see who does have visibility? So this is another good question and I hope I'm gonna answer it, Rachel. So if I missed the point of your question, please rechat it and let me know. But I think what this question is about is that the client visibility versus the case visibility. And again, case is our term for the pass our process. Um, and then there's client. So everybody has client visibility. Um, and this kind of comes down to, again, the provider executive has given the, author, uh, the authorized official kind of the authority to say, our agency is going to see Medicaid member data. Then the authorized official that creates the accounts has a responsibility to only create accounts for people that can see Medicaid data <laughs> on, or can see the, the insurance data on these folks and the health data. We do take that process very seriously. So there, there is at least that kind of security guard built in where you can see the client, um, but you might not get to see all of the things that have been submitted for them. So you can search for the client, you can see the client, um, even if you've never created the client or you don't have anything assigned to that client, um, but you just wouldn't be able to see all the details. Stephanie, is there another way to explain that um, in case I goofed that one a little bit? Felt no, like I think you did good. Felt like a long-winded response to, hopefully I understood the question too. So Rachel, you let me know if I missed that one. Um, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can. Sorry, I'm going to unmute myself. So my question is, if we can see the member, which is great, can we also see who does have visibility so I know who to request it from? No, because you wouldn't even see the fact that a PASSAR exists. So you would, you go to their member hub, you can see their member hub, you can see all their information there. But when you go to that kind of it's under the utilization management tab, again, because we're our attic is on top of that house. So we would look at that utilization management tab and you'd be able to see a row for each PASSAR or each event that Telogen has reviewed for that member if your agency has been connected to that event, that review, that PASSAR, that case. But if you haven't been added to the case, you can't see the row. Um, that data just wouldn't be there. So that, that's where, again, the, the communication and the partnership, I think we have a huge opportunity to figure out how to make sure that the case management agencies are added early uh, when necessary on cases you didn't create them for. Does that make sense? Does that help answer the question, Rachel? It does. I think it's just really communication with the hospitals and the nursing homes then to make sure we're added and mm -hmm. we'll work with you on the back end if we can't get added. So, okay, thank yep. you. Yep, exactly. Okay, uh, next question. Thank you for going off mute. That was very helpful. Um, Barb has the next question. Since these slides won't be available until later this week, um, please share the info about the links to get started again. Yes, we will share those links. Somebody who's not me, are you able to share those links to the website for the PASSAR, for the Qualitrack information, and then also the link for the PASSAR trainings? Two websites. I'm going to count on somebody else. Oh, I can do that. Thank you, yeah. Obi. <laughs> Thanks for, for owning that one. So Obi's going to do it, everybody. You should put that in there. Um, then you have the emails from Stephanie and myself. You've got both of our emails there. Um, next question. If we registered last week during the Qualitrack registration process, will we need to register again specifically for PASSAR? No. Um, this is another good thing about Qualitrack is once you're in, you're in. You don't need to redo a registration for different tasks. 
Um, once you have access to the Colorado Qualitrack instance, um, you'll be able to do multiple things in there, whatever you need to um, for the different tasks you're working, uh, which I think is, is hopefully a good fit. So no, you would not have to redo that. And good job getting an early jump on this. Um, that link has been live for a little bit. So uh, like I said, we've already had several people fill out that provider executive and identify their authorized officials. We haven't sent any links to any authorized officials yet. Just say that again, those will come out next week, but it is perfectly fine to get them identified so that we have a heads up of who's who um, so that we can start building our list for that. Um, next up, Jay Perla. Where would I submit a case for CHCBS and cost containment form? We happen to also have Pam Valvano on the phone today. So Pam, are you able to speak to this or should we just table it for another meeting? Yes, that is, um, you will hear more about that on um, the, the information that we sent out. The, the other person that asked about the next question about the training tomorrow from three to four, that's the training that's gonna show you how to submit those cases. So for CHCBS, cost okay. containment, um, CES, CDAS, IHSS, all those acronyms, all of those are going right into that utilization management unit where CASAR goes in. You'll just be submitting a different type of review. And we're gonna go over that tomorrow in that training. Perfect. So Pam, again, that was a little quiet for me. So I'm gonna restate what Pam just said. So to connect Jay Perla's question with Stephanie's question too. Um, yeah, tomorrow from three to 4 p.m. will be another training about Qualitrack and you only need to do Qualitrack once. Once you've kind of registered yourself with Qualitrack and got trained on how to use Qualitrack, um, it's gonna be the same process for PASSAR as for the other tasks. So knowing how to get to that member hub, knowing how to search for a member, add a member, navigate through the member hub, everything lives under that utilization management umbrella. And whether you're requesting a pass our task or a cost containment pass our task, you, you'll be able to do all of that from the same spot. So the training tomorrow from three to four is a good one. Um, next question. Oh, and then Pam, you actually made a comment. So perfect. Um, do, do, do. So where to complete the registration for the executive representative? So that is, Obi just added the, the links. So the Qualitrack link that's at the pre, oh, actually, Obi, I think you did them backwards. So the one that he labeled Qualitrack is the PASSAR uh, one. And the one that he labeled the PASSAR one, oh no, you just did the same link twice, I think. I'm sorry, I think I, I oh gosh, I, I pasted it double. Hold on, sorry about that. Obi, we can <laughs> do a job. Um, I know he'll get it. So we've got the, the link for Qualitrack and all of the provider registration information is the senior long-term care site. Um, and we will get you that link as well. And then the link for all the PASSAR specific training information is gonna live on PASSAR webpage. Um, and we talked about the training tomorrow. So Jean, let me just clarify that yeah. for a second. Please go for it, Pam. Tomorrow and the next comment by Stephanie, and you're correct. That was sent out to the executive or the main contact from each case management agency, and they were asked to have two or three people attend that training. And then we will have recordings of that training, and that will be available. And our request, and the, and the state's request, was that um, the folks who attend that help train the users within the case management agency, just because there's so many people um, within all of the case management agencies. We also have another session of that next week, and all of that information was sent out to the main contacts or the executives of the case management agency. So check with them to see who they're planning on having attend. Okay, did everybody get to hear that okay? Again, I know Pam, somehow you're a little bit quiet for me. Okay, hey, hopefully everybody else was able to hear that. That was a lot of good content, Pam, and I definitely don't wanna misinterpret that by playing telephone. So um, I'm gonna hope folks heard you. So we've got 12 minutes left. I'm curious if there's any more questions that we can answer. There's a lot of trainings about a lot of things coming up and I'm sure keeping them straight with what dates you need to do packets for, what dates you need to sign up for um, can get overwhelming and confusing. And the reason we're having, we wanna over communicate rather than under communicate. So we're really trying to make sure all the information gets out there and you guys have as many opportunities as possible to receive information that's relevant to you. 
Some of it may overlap, some of it may be repetitive, but again, the hope here is that the multiple times you can see content, things will start to click. Uh, and then when the go live of March 1st happens, you'll feel like you already know the system and you're, you're ready to live in it. And it is a user-friendly system. I know I, I personally use that Qualitrack logo that Stephanie mentioned regularly. Um, if I ever need to kind of reorient myself to where I'm at, I just click that Qualitrack button and I get brought back to kind of that main page, which is always helpful. Oh yeah, people couldn't hear you, Pam. So um, can you try to say it again a little bit slower and then I can repeat it back to you? I'm going to try yeah, to listen. I'm typing it in, Jean. Oh, you're typing it in. Quiet. Excellent. Typing it in. So everybody that couldn't hear Pam, all of that good information that I heard quietly and don't want to risk repeating back incorrectly, um, she will type that into the chat. So that should be good. Yep, and then Obi republished the correct website for Qualitech. Thanks, Obi. Um, so yes, the one that he said that says at 147, which says the senior, the long-term services and supports, um, that's the website where Qualitrack will live uh, for all tasks. It's going to be the one-stop portal for everything. Okay. I will ask if there's any other questions. I know Pam's going to be typing, so I'm trying to do a little tap dance while she types to give her time to let her fingers work. She did have a lot of good content. Stephanie, are we missing anything from the other trainings and the great Q&A sessions we've had to make sure we cover it here? One thing I can think of is that for those of you that are going to be the authorized officials and you'll see this information in that user guide that gets sent to you and is posted on the website. Um, but one thing that you do have to create for each user that you set up in the system is a um, original, <laughs> I don't want to say original, but a username for that user and that username has to be unique to that user. Um, so like my name is Stephanie Wilson. So usually my username gets set up as S Wilson, which can sometimes be generic because there could be a whole lot of S Wilson's and Wilson is a pretty generic last name. So like my username in Qualitrack may be S Wilson one, two, three to make sure that that's unique in the system. Um, so that that has that email address attached to it and stuff like that. So as you're thinking about what users that you need to set up, um, you know, first initial last name, or if you use first name dot last name or whatever, but kind of think of what um, process you want to follow to set up those usernames. If you set up a username or if you set up a user and that username is not unique, you'll get a little red error message that says that username is already in the system and to please enter another one. So it's just kind of a heads up to let you know that's something that you have to do. Like I said, it'll walk you through that in the user guide, um, but those those are unique identifiers for each user in the system and will have to be um, unique. So you might want to think of that as you're thinking about how many users you have to set up. Is there a character limit on that, Stephanie? If there is, it's a long character <laughs> limit because people put, you know, first, middle, initial, last name. They put a lot, they, they've they used stuff depending. Every organization seems like they have their own process for what they want to use for those identifiers, whether it's in their email or, you know, usernames for systems or things like that. And I've seen some pretty extensive ones. So um, you have quite a bit of space to decide what you want to use there. But yet you have not seen rainbow unicorn sparkly pants. No, because no one would be able to remember it. Yeah, and that's silly. So <laughs> it's unique. It definitely wouldn't exist, but it wouldn't have a character limit either. Good to know. Right. All right. So, so I think that's the only thing we talked about before that we haven't talked about in this one. Okay. So I think then Pam was able to add her information. Um, there's one last question here. It says, what is the link for the meeting tomorrow if we do not have representation yet? Pam, I'm so glad you're here today. <laughs> Can you cover that one too? and tell either type it or tell me because I can repeat to it back. talk again and see if you can hear me can you hear me now I can hear you barely but I'll repeat whatever you say that's good um the training tomorrow is uh, is going through the executives and the leadership so they should have gotten my email if they haven't gotten it 
they can send me an email and I will make sure that they get the information. Okay. They are designating. Let me, let me repeat that before I lose it. <laughs> so the Pam sent an email to the representation for each agency. So that should have sparked them to set people up. If you believe that your agency, your executive leadership has not received Pam's email, her email is now in the chat. So please email Pam and she can forward that information on to the executive leadership. Is that correct, Pam? That is correct. Okay. So there we go. Is this particular training offered again live? This particular training is not being offered again live. However, we are recording. Um, so what we will be doing is publishing again recordings. We've done this session with this content three times today. We will be publishing video for all three. We will be posting a single slide deck because we use the same slides for all the training. We'll be publishing a transcript and we'll be publishing a summary Q&A document. So all in all, that's what? Six files. We're publishing six files for each, each week that we're doing trainings for. So the six files from the ninth and the six files from today, um, I'm hoping will all be published on Friday, by Friday of this week on the state's pass our site. Is that that's fair, Obi? That's the date we're shooting for is this Friday for all for last week and this week? Yes, uh, by the end of this, before, by the end of this week, it should be up in Okay, great. And we will not be emailing folks uh, with an email blast, so just please keep checking the state's website. Um, but if you don't see it by Friday, feel free to blast my email and say, you said Friday, I don't see it. I will take those emails gladly because um, I, I want you to have this content, so. Okay. I think we are okay then, folks. We have five minutes to go. Um, I can stay here for a minute and see, but we've already had about 10 people drop. We got up to about 155 folks in the beginning. So thank you. So if you can go back to that last page, perfect, Stephanie, thank you. So we've talked a lot about the what and the who and the when, but I think I really wanna end this session today with the why. Why are we doing this? We are doing this because PASAR is a patient-centered process that provides an objective clinical assessment for folks that could potentially benefit from these additional services as they enter nursing home. This is about member care. PASAR has been around forever. It's been around for th over three decades, not forever, over three decades, um, but continues to maintain relevance. So we, we believe in it, it still has utility. And this is again about a clinical opportunity, not paperwork, not just having something that can live in a file, live in a member record to pass an audit. This is actually meaningful content. Our turnaround times and the utility of the documentation we provide is of the utmost importance to Telogen. We take that very seriously. Um, and lastly, we are committed to hearing directly from you. Our emails are in the chat. We want to hear from you. So if you have any questions, just let us know. But I've had a really good time today. So thank you all very much for spending some time with us. As you leave here, I want you to think about two things. What did you take away from today? What was anything little interesting nugget that you'll carry with you? And then what, if anything, are you gonna do differently as a result of having spent an hour with us out of your busy day today? So thank you all very much. With that, I'll close the meeting. Bye.